I'm Tanner Hannum. Um, I work at Henry Ford Hospital. Um, have the uh, great pleasure and honor to work with Dr. Manny Menon. He was one of the uh, people that you know I got uh, introduced to and uh, was very, very encouraging. Um, I also had the honor of observing uh, Dr. Magnuson at University of Alabama in my early training. I was uh, one of the early sort of second wave, so you know the FDA approval was in December of 2009, um, and um, I actually. Uh, attended one of the talks by Dr. Greg uh, Weinstein at, uh, um, at our Michigan Otolaryngology Society. It was in February. I remember very well, very vividly that, that, that talk. It was one of the things, you know, that you kind of look back on and you say, that was an aha moment, you know. So for me, I saw the talk. I was actually very, very, um, by nature, I'm um, very skeptical. Uh, so I was sort of skeptical about, you know, this, and then I saw the video and I said, mm, you know, this is, this looks doable. So if, the, if there is really, as he's saying, uh, good oncological result and good functional outcomes, I think this may be something very doable. So uh, I went ahead and, and, and pursued my training. It was very difficult at that time to, to do that, but uh, I was able to uh, observe Dr. Magnus at the University of Alabama. I worked also with Chris Holsinger at MD Anderson. and. Um, uh, that was uh, that was it. So uh, what I'm um, th since I work at Henry Ford Hospital, I have to talk about uh, uh, Henry Ford. And and the, actually, he is a, a very very interesting uh, person. Has a lot of very interesting quotes. Um, but this is this is uh, sort of the model of my talk today, because uh, I'm going to hopefully. Um, give you a different perspective on oropharyngeal cancers. And, and, and the uh, lady who asked about the, um, you know, are there any contraindications and things. I'll start showing you some things that, that you know, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. So T1, T2 um, is, is sort of the, the, uh, the, the beginning stuff that, that we can do a lot more with this technology. Um, so if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So, you know, you have to kind of sometimes think outside the box and say, you know, if I have a, this, the robot is a surgical tool. It's like a microscope for a neurotologist or an a, or a endoscope for a sinus surgeon. It's a tool in your hands. The surgery is still the surgery, whether you do it open or whether you do it endoscopically, it's still the surgery. The tool is helping you perfect the surgery get certain elements of the surgery right. And this is what transoral robotic surgery here is doing. So this, I'd like to keep, keep, I would like to keep that in mind. Um, so the treatment paradigm for oropharyngeal cancer, the traditional tr treatment paradigm for early stage T1, T2, usually it's surgery uh, or radiation therapy. Um, usually most people say, you know what, just radiation is easier for T1, T2, um, and we leave surgery for salvage. For advanced stage disease, T3, T4, the recommendation, the NCCN guidelines, is T3, T4, chemo radiation. And you say, okay, we'll leave surgery for salvage. As we start kind of looking into this, and this is going to be a gradual process, change does not come automatically. Radiation therapists, medical oncologists are programmed, okay? And it's very, very difficult. So, so are surgeons, but it's very, very difficult to change practice. But what I'm going to show you is that, you know, for T1, T2, we're already in this, this is becoming more and more acceptable as Dr. Magnuson's and other uh, pioneers in our field have, have really shown the data uh, to really show the, the efficacy. So that, that has been shown. I think this, this part here, that's still not out there because the FDA has not approved that. And uh, the existing data on surgery is actually better than radiation. If you go back to the historical open surgery data, you put the data up, you know, side by side to chemo radiation. Surgery is still better, followed by radiation therapy. The only reason is functional outcomes have been bad, and they're big surgeries. So that's why you know people have not uh, decided to do this. So when you see open surgery, you know this is what I'm, this is what I do for a living. So you know I'm a microvascular surgeon. You know my colleague does the cancer ablation, or I do the cancer ablation. We put a free flap in there and we close us up. And you know, patient does okay, but it takes them a while to recover. There is blood loss, long hospital stay, those kinds of things. So you know, open surgical approaches. Uh, that's why people kind of shy away from that, and it's easier to convince a patient to have chemo radiation five days a week uh, for eight weeks than to undergo this major operation for all the different uh, morbidities uh, listed there. So non-surgical treatment of oropharyngeal cancer. Where does this idea come from? 
uh, it came from organ preservation treatment. And Dr. Magnus mentioned yesterday, Dr. Greg Wolf studied the VA trial, which everybody knows about the, the VA trial. It was originally actually designed for laryngeal cancer, supraglottic cancer specifically. And the idea was, can you avoid total laryngectomy in some of these cancers? And the problem is, as surgeons, even for T1, T2, there was a time when everybody got a laryngectomy. Just as Dr. Magnuson mentioned, you know, you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We had a total laryngectomy and everything just, you know, T1, T2, T3, T4, it was all getting laryngectomy. So people then said, okay, you know what, we need to limit this and we need to look at organ preservation. And this is where the whole idea came from. So the idea for organ preservation came from trying to preserve the larynx, but it was extrapolated to other things, such as oral pharynx. And people said, so my, you know, organ preservation uh, for oropharyngeal cancer, either with radiation therapy or combined chemo radi radiation. And the idea behind chemo, uh, combined uh, chemo radiation is that, that you can have a synergistic effect between the chemo and the radiation to improve uh, survival. And this is uh, sort of one of the highly cited articles looking at the benefit of adding chemo to radiation. Interestingly, if you look at five years, the survival difference of adding all that chemo and this is about 8% four months in terms of extending kind of life in terms of so the the addition of chemo is not really a great thing we're taught that extracapsular spread we're taught you know that automatically you give it yes there is some but in terms of survival if you look at big meta analyses there is really not as much as, as we, we tend to uh, think and with, with a lot of comorbidity for patients so uh, toxicity of chemo and radiation therapy so you know we all know these things but if you actually look, and this is from radiation oncology literature, 33% severe aspiration in this one study, 9% died of pneumonia. They actually looked. So this was a study looking at specifically swallowing complications from, from radiation therapy. And this is 2006, so this is not something, you know, uh, with cobalt radiation. This is IMRT uh, type material. Um, loss of taste, zero stomia, renal failure, hearing loss. I mean, how many of you ask patients, and how many of your medical oncologists actually get pre-chemo pre uh, audiograms? What you find out? Uh, it, it's very, very uh, common. Now, the other thing, too, is that studies, if you actually look at the big trials, the chemo radiation trials, they'll mention their mortality rate, 1.9 to 3.3%. So when we talk about, you know, transoral robotic surgery or trans, uh, trans um, uh, oral laser microsurgery, with those things, yeah, there is obviously risks and things like that, but um, the alternative chemo radiation is not without risk, and this is something that you have to remind patients. So um, for oropharyngeal uh, cancers, I'd like to ask the question, what organ are we trying to spare in oropharyngeal cancer? In laryngeal cancer, it's obvious, but in oropharyngeal cancer, what, what is the organ? So there is no organ that we're trying to spare. Are we trying to spare a tonsil, a little basic tonsil? There, that's inconsequential. But what, it is, what is important is actually swallowing function. And, and so the question is not an organ sparing approach. The question should be what function are you, or what function are you trying to preserve for that patient? So if, so if we can offer surgical treatment uh, with minimally invasive surgery to preserve the function, then I think that is the goal that we should be trying to achieve. And that's, that's, that's gonna be key as we um, try to uh, look at a paradigm change in terms of how we look at some of these uh, cancers, is looking at functional outcomes. Um, so advantages of minimally invasive surgery, this has been already uh, mentioned before, um, so we won't elaborate much there. So the question, and that I'm interested in, because we're doing some of these uh, more advanced stage uh, cancers, can we perform minimally invasive surgery with better survival outcomes for T3, T4 uh, orphanage cancers and still maintain function? And if you look at the old papers in terms of looking at open surgery followed by adjuvant radiation, plus or minus chemo, um, there, 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 there was a survival benefit, but the, the problem is the functional outcomes were, were very, very poor. And um, this is citing actually some of the papers that Dr. Magnuson had already mentioned. But this is, there is no, one of the problems that we have in this field, there is no head-to-head -head randomized control trial looking at surgery versus chemo radiation. So all of the things, these are all inferences. If you look at even medical oncology literature, they'll tell you, we don't really know the answer in oropharynx. We're extrapolating from laryngeal cancer data. We don't know the answer, but we're just doing it because the surgery is so morbid. 
But if you look, so this is this is looking at stage three, stage four, and so we don't have very good T, you know, right now the, for advanced stage T3, T4, there is not great comparison. But if you look at survival, lo local regional control, 87%, 67%, Bruce Howey, transoral laser microsurgery, 97%. Weinstein, 94% at two years. This is three years, two years, this is five years, this is at three years. Uh, this is from the RTOG, 0129. Overall survival, 64.3% at three years. For HPV positive cancer, 82%, HPV negative, 57%. This is gonna be huge as we start finding out more about the role of HPV. HPV is a good predict, it's a predictor for better outcome. So, when people cite all of these results, you're going to need to sort out, you know, what is the HPV rate. But as you can see, surgery is right up there. So these are, uh, this is with uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery. So if you look at transoral laser microsurgery, this is uh, from Bruce Howey's uh, paper. Uh, T1 is up there, T2, T3, and then uh, T4. You can see that there is a big... Uh, difference between T1, T2, uh, cancer for transoral laser microsurgery. This is from Dr. Magnuson's uh, paper. Um, but survival is is, uh, is generally good, just as good or even better than, than chemo radiation. So transoral uh, robotic surgery, again, we talked a little bit about the exposure and suspension. Um, my practice is a little bit different. I don't have the high volume that, that Dr. Magnuson has, so I actually do a lot of my neck dissections concurrently. And to answer the question about uh, the risk of fistula, we have a paper, hopefully that will be coming out on this uh, uh, topic. Um, it's about 10% to 15%. Uh, Dr. Um, um, uh, there was a recent uh, uh, paper in the, uh, in the literature cited about 15% with doing it concurrently. And the highest risk area is level one when you take out the submandibular gland. It's very easy to get into the uh, floor of mouth and the uh, uh, lateral uh, oral pharynx. That's usually where it happens. When that does happen though, usually you find out about it in the operating room. So both cases that I've had, uh, we found out about it in the operating room. We're able to fix it with a posterior belly uh, of the Pulse your belly with that gastric, you patch it up and sew it, put some seal, put a nasal, a nasal uh, tube in and not feed the patient for seven days and I've not had any consequences from that. So indications of TORS, we already mentioned that. Um, early stage T1 uh, and T2 disease as well as uh, benign uh, conditions, as well as actually unknown primary. And this is something maybe at the end we can maybe discuss this. This is a very, very interesting area. So unknown primary now, that's actually changing because we're actually finding a lot of these unknown primaries to be one to two, three millimeter base of tongue, circumvallate, papilla things that just, you, you just, anybody would look at it and say, oh, there's not cancer, there's just circumvallate. You know, it's just a small tumor there. And so for a lot of these, um, um, you can actually use pores to uh, do, rather than just random tongue biopsy, you do sort of uh, what Dr. Magnuson has shown uh, with taking out the lingual tonsils, and you take the entire lingual tonsil from the base of tongue. It's similar to a sleep apnea surgery. And a lot of times that you will find your unknown primary. And people have been finding out that it's about 90 to 95 percent that they're finding the, the unknown primary in either tonsil or base of tongue. The areas in light gray is um, uh, T3, T4, um, and uh, salvage uh, surgery. Those are areas that are not FDA approved, but we've been using it, and the results are interesting, and we're in process right now of putting our uh, papers uh, to, uh, in the literature uh, on this. So this is a, a case example. Um, fairly recent cases is an uh, interesting 69-year-old um, male with one uh, month history of a rapidly expanding mass in his, uh, in his throat um, and uh, was unable to handle his secretions. He was transferred from an outside hospital to our hospital for airway concerns. At the outside hospital, they had done a, a quick biopsy. They looked at it and said, it's not lymphoma, but it doesn't look uh, part, uh, similar to a squamous cell carcinoma. So they sent it to another hospital. We didn't have the path. The patient was a heavy smoker, drinker, and went to actually DT's uh, day one and, and when, when he was in, in our hospital. So we, um, in this particular case, uh, we used transoral uh, laser, uh, sorry, we used uh, uh, TORS to uh, remove the uh, base tongue mass that was large. Um, as you can see here, it's pretty much, this is his uvula, this is a soft palate. It was pretty much uh, closing off his, his oropharynx. Uh, we tricked him. Pathology came back from that osteosarcoma. 
very interesting. There was actually cartilage and things like that in, uh, in there. Um, so the, this is just an illustrative of uh, taking out large uh, tumors. I will show you some video um, uh, on uh, reconstructive aspects and which, which defects you have to reconstruct and which defects you don't have to. Post-operative care, um, so generally uh, admit to the floor for early stage disease. So T1, T2 um, usually go to the floor uh, and uh, we extubate in the OR. For uh, patients that go to the ICU are usually T3, T4 uh, tumors with, with uh, you know, concern for swelling um, and uh, salvage uh, surgery. I don't usually put feeding tubes. So I used to put, uh, it was a matter of routine for me to put feeding tubes. The first five patients I did that and everybody asked me please get it out. So I take the feeding tube out. For pain control, I actually like uh, liquid oxycodone or li liquid Lortab. There's also a morphine that you can give oral. So we uh, switch uh, to that and I put them on the pain medication every four hours and uh, we, don't, we don't usually have any problems in terms of people coming back dehydrated. There is a few, but that's um, this usually a lot of problems. So we don't usually put routinely uh, nasal feeding tubes unless we're doing a free flap or there's uh, some other concerns about patients uh, poor swallowing uh, preoperatively. Uh, trachs also, uh, unless we put in a free flap or there's concern for uh, airway swelling afterwards. Uh, hospital stay, if we're just doing straightforward tours for T1, T2, usually one day, maybe two at the most, but usually one day. For neck dissection, good cabinet, neck dissection done at the same time, it's two to three days, and then for free flaps, usually about seven to ten days for, for hospital stay. <clears throat> so, in order to be able to do T3, T4, <coughs> this is the key. We, we mentioned before about um, poor functional outcomes. I think a very, very important thing that you have to uh, uh, consider here is the ability to reconstruct the oral pharynx. So you're going to take a large amount of tissue from this area. You're going to expose potentially the carotid. You're going to make a big hole between the neck and the, um, and, uh, and the oral pharynx. That area that, that you create, you have to be able to fix that. And if you were doing an open procedure, as a free flap surgeon or as a head and neck surgeon, would say, "Yep, you know, we have to we have to fix that." So, with uh, robotic surgery, and this is the thing that I learned uh, when I first uh, did this, was actually the robot makes it easier for you to reconstruct the defect. And sewing and things like that, as I will show you later, is actually fairly straightforward. Um, and the length of time for the surgery now is actually probably faster doing it robotically than doing a big mandible lip split, free flap reconstruction. I can get the same case done robotically um, about the same, same amount of time, maybe even faster. I haven't, I haven't kept record of it, but it's about the same. Um, so the indication for free flap reconstruction, and we're talking about if you remove more than half of the soft palate. So those patients are going to get terrible velopharyngeal insufficiency. Uh, they may even get nasopharyngeal scarring if you don't fix it. Wide exposure of the carotid artery. The robot allows you can do, you can take the peripharyngeal space fat off the carotid. I mean, if there's a tumor going into peripharyngeal space fat that's a T4, you can go after that. If there's a tumor going into the pterygoid, you can go after that. Um, and you can, you know, it's, if, if you've taken it where you have a microscopic positive margin and you're going to give chemo radiation for that, for the patient, it's much, much better. And even your medical oncologist will tell you that. You have a much, much better chance of curing that patient with that than leaving gross disease behind. So, because you don't have the, the, the bulk of the disease there, you've debulked the, 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 the tumor. Uh, removal more than half base of tongue. Uh, soft palate, lateral pharyngeal wall, base of tongue, floor of mouth resection. These are major, major operations. This is stuff that the only way to do it would be open. We can do this uh, uh, through the mouth. And then salvage uh, surgery. Not all salvage surgery, I'm going to preface it, not all salvage surgery is going to need a free flap. There are some small tumors and things like that that would not need free flap reconstruction. Interestingly, at the same time that I published my paper on transoral uh, robotic uh, reconstruction, um, Dr. Eric Gendon published uh, in his case series on, uh, on, on reconstruction the same month. Um, so transoral provides free flap reconstruction. This is a case example here. This was a gentleman with a recurrent T1 tonsil cancer um, that was basically in the field of radiation. It was a small T1 um, tonsil and for some reason it did not respond. 
Uh, we did a transformer robotic resection. Um, it's hard to see because of the lights, but this is the mandible. This is the last molar right here. And the carotid artery, we had basically skeletonized the carotid artery. He was very, very heavily radiated. Everything was extremely stiff. We did a concatenate neck dissection at the same time. And uh, um, so for this, what we do is we take a, the, the, the best reconstruction. I've used, one, I had one case where we did a antral lateral thigh free flap. All the remaining free flap reconstructions have been with radial forearm free flaps. Um, one thing when I take a radial forearm free flap is we take the skin graft directly from the skin paddle to avoid the thigh, uh, uh, the thigh skin graft. We've published this in Otolaryngology, had an ex surgery uh, journal. Um, and since that publication, we put 65 cases in that case series with Dr. Mark Wax. Um, this, uh, we've done now over probably 400 of these cases, and we, we not have any uh, problems with this. It, it does not affect the flap. But the nice thing for the patient is the skin graft site hurts a lot, so you, this way you don't have to worry about that. The way, so once you take the radial forearm free flap, we've done the, the transoral robotic surgery is completed. We do one or two neck dissections depending on the, on the case. Harvest, then we uh, pass the free flap. This is a one inch Penrose drain you put through the mouth into the neck. So this is where it comes out in the neck. You pass the tissue from the arm. It's based on the radial artery. The artery gets passed and the vein gets passed uh, uh, through to the neck, through the Penrose. And then you um, do the vessel anastomosis using microscope or loops uh, into the neck. I couple the veins. I use a vein coupler. Um, makes things go faster. And um, once you've, you've established perfusion for the, uh, for the free flap, you close your neck incision, and then you inset your, your, uh, your free flap robotically. And I can show you a video of that. But the nice thing is, when you do this reconstruction compared to open, this is much, much more precise. You don't open, when you do open, the whole anatomy is flayed open. So as a reconstructive surgeon, you're putting a piece of skin there, you're sewing, and you don't know exactly how this is going to, at the end, come together. So it may be a little bit too bulky. With this, you don't have anything open. This is the anatomy that, that's going to be there. So you're sewing it into the defect, and you're fitting it in where it needs to be. So if you need to trim the size of the skin, you can trim it down a little bit. If you need to put suture to bulk it up, you can do that. And um, um, <clears throat> until I did this, I didn't think that this was uh, uh, possible. Um, and when I first did this, the, when I first started doing this, I didn't see any publications in the literature of doing this. But I had a patient who had a problem and had very bad velopharyngeal insufficiency. The area was too big to heal the soft palate, um, and we had to do something to fix it. So I said, well, if I did this as an open surgery, what would I do? I would put a free flap in as a, as a microvascular surgeon. So I talked to the patient. I said, you know, I haven't seen this described in the literature, but if we had to do an open procedure, and the only way I can fix this is with a, with a, with a free flap in my hand. So, you know, if I can't do it robotically, I'll have to do it open. But I think I can do this robotically. So I did my first case and found out that the guy did great. So then I, I had other cases that we developed this in and found out that this works really well. So th these are some just examples. This is three months out from the radial forearm free flap. Here we've taken half of the soft palate. This was a high writing tumor. The patient had uh, trismus uh, preoperatively. You can see postoperatively now he can actually open. And this particular patient um, had uh, no, he, he didn't want any adjuvant uh, radiation therapy for his uh, T3 tumor. So he's, he's, being, um, he's being watched. But um, you can see his jaw opening has is, is gotten much bigger. This heals very well. No velopharyngeal insufficiency. This is an endoscopic view of another patient. This is tongue. This is uvula. And the flap usually heals great. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the robotic experience at Henry Ford. So I started doing robotic surgery March 30th of 2010. Uh, we started the first case. We've done over uh, 60 robotic procedures. 44 cases uh, performed for oropharyngeal, supraglottic, and esophageal cancer. Yeah, yeah. The, the bulk of the work that I do is, is uh, involving uh, cancer uh, surgery. In this cohort, T3, uh, T4 has compromised 11 uh, uh, patients. And actually, since uh, we've done this, we have uh, more uh, patients. We're about 15, 16 right now. Demographics. Um, 
male to female ratio of five to one. Um, in Detroit, we have a large African American population, and where this is important is we talk about HPV. African Americans tend to have less HPV positive or fragile cancer, and uh, I don't have all the data yet on our HPV. Um, uh, uh, numbers in our cohort, but it's about 50%. So whereas a lot of centers are citing 80%, 90% HPV positivity, we're about 50%. And this becomes important when we look at survival. Um, <clears throat> the mean age is uh, 60.4. Um, four of these cases, T3, T4, were actually done after for, for salvage purposes. And median follow-up in this cohort is uh, 13 months. Base of tongue was the most common site. <clears throat> So uh, adjunctive uh, procedures, so adjuvant, um, seven out of the 11 patients received uh, adjuvant radiation or chemo radiation therapy. <coughs> Five of uh, the 11 uh, had free flaps. Four of the 11 had trachs, and pegs were put in uh, in seven of the patients, 63%. So uh, looking at PEG use, and this is unpublished data. We've, uh, we've uh, submitted an abstract to CASA meeting uh, in San Diego, but this is, this is similar to what you see in the literature, Dr. Magnuson's results, Dr. Weinstein's results, um, Eric Moore and, and uh, uh, others. Uh, primary tours for T1, T2 without adjuvant treatment, and we had about 25% in our entire case series that we were able to save the patient from any radiation or chemotherapy. It was an isolated uh, tonsil or base of tongue with negative margins, no perineural invasion, and zero neck, you can observe or a small N1, uh, no extra capsular spread. So in, the, in this particular cohort, in, in those patients not receiving adjuvant therapy, no need for PEGS. Primary tours for T1, T2 with adjuvant treatment, about a third of them required PEG2. Primary tours for T3, T4, 42.9%. Um, so you can see it goes up. But the largest is for the salvage uh, surgery group, and that's, that's a separate kind of group when, when, when you look at that. Um, it, it, at, a, at one year, only one patient in the entire group uh, required a, uh, a PEG tube, and he's, he's completely MPO. <clears throat> um, other outcomes, so mean hospital stay, and this is now looking, uh, mind you, this is T3, T4, and salvage patients. So this is a different patient population than that's out there in the literature with predominantly T1, T2 cancers. These are advanced uh, uh, type tumors. Um, so 5.9 days hospital stay, two to eight days. So if we were to do this open kind of procedure, you know, at least at least most of them would be there for you know a week to two weeks, pretty common. If you did a lip split, mandible split, they'll have tracheostomies and that kind of thing. Our rate of tracheostomy. Um, trait duration, uh, about two weeks uh, for, for most of these, and most of these were done with, uh, because they had three flaps. Uh, one patient had persistent disease after chemo radiation. She had a large T4 uh, tumor, and uh, the tumor actually grew through chemo radiation. She was an HIV patient, and uh, uh, she was referred to hospice care. Uh, one patient developed a new primary of the floor of mouth of a small T1 with a contralateral uh, neck disease in this group. So in terms of disease control, and you know, it's too early, it's 13 months, um, but uh, disease control seems to be very good. We've been looking at quality of life, and also we've been using the MD Anderson uh, quality of life questionnaire um, uh, on, a, on a consistent uh, basis for the entire cohort. And this is work that uh, we've submitted for the uh, American Head and Neck Society meeting in Toronto. These are unpublished results, but if you look at University of Washington quality of life questionnaire, uh, the higher the number, the better here on the y-axis. So preoperatively, this is where the patients are. This is separating the blue is T1, T2, so early T stage. The purple is the uh, advanced T stage, T3, T4. So you can see preoperatively, the T1, T2s are doing better than, than the T3, T4. But then one month after the operation, three months, six months, and then a year. This is an interesting trend. So these two asterisks here, this, this difference here is statistically significant at one month and three months. So the T3, T4 it takes them a little bit more time to kind of recover initially than the T1, T2s. But then you look at six months and look at it one year, they actually approach, it becomes almost similar. And the argument that we're making here, and I think that the big difference is a lot of it has to do with the ability to reconstruct. 
and minimally invasive surgery. I think that we're able to do a much better reconstruction. I think we're able to um, be able to achieve much better functional uh, results for these patients, and that's where the quality of life is improving. Um, this is a, if you're not from Detroit, you wouldn't know this, but this is Robert Bob. He's, uh, he was the emergency um, uh, public school manager in Detroit. He was a public figure that was brought in to control corruptness and control bad budgets and things like that. And he was not liked in Detroit by a lot of the uh, school teachers because he was, you know, cutting uh, people down. He was uh, in the news uh, on a daily basis. He was one of my patients. He underwent uh, transoral robotic surgery. He had initially we clinically staged him as a T2. Uh, when we went into the operation, actually the. the the tumor size pathologically was a T3. A week after his surgery, transoral robotic surgery, he was giving commencement speech at the University of Michigan. So function, he stayed in the hospital two days after a big T3 excision. He did not require uh, any kind of free flap or anything like that. No trach. Um, went home day two, um, and surgery was Monday. Saturday he was giving commencement speech at the University of Michigan. And uh, he had staged uh, neck dissections and things like that. He was in public for a whole year. He didn't come out with his story. And uh, he came out with it a year afterwards and it was in the news and, you know, um, a lot of people talked about it. But um, this type of surgery, in terms of quality of life, I, I was a very um, skeptical person initially. But when I started seeing results and seeing how people uh, recover from this, it's really amazing. So. Um, the idea, going back to this uh, schema, is oropharyngeal cancer, the, the tides are starting to turn. And I think it started already for the T1, T2. Now, you know, it used to be in the NCCN guideline that radiation and surgery are options and, and, uh, and uh, you know, but we always just send people for radiation. Now that's really um, that's really turning. I think as more and more uh, numbers come out, I think that's going to uh, be favorable. The area for T3, T4, and salvage is is uh, kind of areas that we're still gathering more data. The answers are not completely all there yet, but it's exciting to be able to be um, a part of that and look at that. Thank you very much. So how are we doing with time? Okay, um, so the the superglottic uh, cancer, we're going to just show video. I think, you know, the best thing to do is just show kind of videos of those. Um, but is here, here uh, so we'll do, we'll switch over now to transaxillary thyroid, so we cover that, and then at the end we'll do the videos. Come on. Any questions for me uh, while he's getting set up? Yeah, I just, I mean, it's just curious about, uh, you know, you explained how you got the pedicle into the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just, I mean, what did you do exactly? I, I didn't get it from that slide. Did you yeah, when I show the video, it will be a lot more apparent what we do. So the robot, you use it for inset. So initially, when you put the flap in, you orient it. You put one or two sutures to secure it in the oropharynx. And um, then you do your microanastomosis in the neck. You close the neck, and then you use the robot to suture the flap in. You know, that's right. But, but when you do a transformer resection, by, by, you do, you've done the resection by torus, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So there is no communication between the neck uh, where you want the pedicle to get into. So I just wanted to know uh, um, what is your route? For yeah. Getting into in some cases, you actually. In some cases, we actually connect. If we're going into the floor of mouth or a very anterior base of tongue, we'll actually have a big hole. You, we'll we'll create a big hole there. Um, in some cases, in some cases you don't. But the the, the muscle layer that's there. You, know, you just put a clamp through and you'll be right in the neck. It's not, it's not much. Yeah. But the reason we're, we're doing it uh, in those particular cases is to fill in soft palate velum so we don't get nasopharyngeal insufficiency or give base of tongue volume or cover a carotid artery. My, my only concern was in your suturing, when we do a soft palate, because I do a lot of this reconstruction, when you when you switch to the soft palate, you uh, to get velopharyngeal sufficiency, you actually have to hitch it up. Sometimes you have to actually hitch it to the posterior pharyngeal wall in order to give it its its space in the oral, you know, in the oropharyngeal space. Yeah. Here, in fact, in your picture, I found that the I mean that's half of the oropharynx was kind of slanted. You know, the the photograph that was shown maybe. 
Uh, um, it depends on the uh, patients and how much of the soft palate we've taken. A lot of times for that, um, I like to put in a nasal trumpet for about seven days afterwards so it heals, so we can pull it off the uh, uh, nasal pharynx. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, um, I'm not sure if that's answering the question that you, you had in mind or... Of course, but if you put a knee, three types of very large defects in the soft palate, and, and somehow, uh, in fact, even the open end setting is is a demanding job. We've mm -hmm. got to really do things to hitch it up. So right. I, I was just wondering how you achieve that. I mean, suturing yeah. edge to edge is not a problem, but how do you do those deep stitches with, with the robot? Actually, makes it easy. 